Welcome to the Center for International and Regional Studies at Georgetown University in Qatar. This podcast series is part of the Energy Humanities Research Initiative. The project aims to generate new scholarly conversations on everyday lived experiences of energy. For ease of listening, we've broken today's conversation into two shorter episodes. In this first half of my conversation with Dr. Acosta, we speak about the complicated ontology of oil, the relationship between the oil state and cultural production, and why the era of the Venezuelan oil boom produced so much abstract kinetic art. Hello to our listeners and uh, welcome to Everyday Energy. I'm Vicky Gugasian. I'm one of uh, three hosts for this podcast series. And this episode is part of what we're thinking of as our our second cluster of podcast episodes where we're taking on the theme of representing oil. And I'll just take this chance uh, to remind everyone, if you haven't listened to our our first episode cluster, where we spoke to three very interesting guests about energy and lived experience, uh, you can find it on our website or on a variety of podcast platforms. Um, along with the other episodes uh, in the Representing Oil Cluster. Uh, So without further ado, um, today I'm thrilled to be speaking with Dr. Santiago Acosta, um, who I'll just take a moment to introduce to you. Uh, Dr. Acosta is a, a scholar and poet working at the intersections of literature, visual culture, and political ecology. And he holds a PhD in Latin American and Iberian cultures from Columbia University. He's currently a postdoctoral fellow at SUNY Old Westbury. He's at work on a book project that I think our listeners should find very interesting and that hopefully we'll chat a little bit about today. Um, It's entitled, We Are Like Oil, An Ecology of the Venezuelan Culture Boom, 1973 to 1983. And it examines the relationship between the visual arts, cultural institutions, and the state-led ecological transformations in Venezuela during the 1970s oil boom. He's also the author of several books of poetry, most recently the award-winning collection El Proximo Desierto, which translates The Coming Desert. So Santiago, welcome. I'm really happy that you were able to take the time to join us today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, um, in this podcast series, I think we've 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 sort of fallen into a little bit of a of a habit or a tradition of asking people to talk a little bit about their origin stories, uh, how they came to be interested in energy and energy studies in the, in the first place. So I'll just kick us off by asking you to say a bit about how um, you came to this topic of uh, oil and, and cultural production as a research interest. Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. And and again, for inviting me to your podcast. Um, that's how I came to be interested in this subject. It's, uh, it's funny because it would seem that uh, the answer should be pretty straightforward, you know, with me being from Venezuela and all the producing country and being a scholar in cultural production. But it actually took me several years and, and different projects to finally develop, I would say, a lasting interest, interest in the subject to sort of, I would say, to find the angle that really resonated uh, with me, right? Um, because I, I studied literature, mainly poetry, I always did a lot of archival work and close readings. Uh, I was thinking about how notions of literary value were formed and the relation between this and practices of interpretation in literary criticism. And I was always very interested in the 1960s and 70s in Venezuela. Uh, In that period, the cultural apparatus expanded. The state cultural apparatus grew because of, um, you know, oil money, basically, from the oil boom of the 70s. Um, But at this point, I wasn't really thinking yet about the relation between the poets that I was reading and and the country's political economy. But then something happened uh, about eight years ago uh, for different reasons, including that I was taking some very interesting seminars at Columbia University during the first year of my PhD. And I became interested in in the subject of indigenous struggles for land. Uh, What happened is that in 2013, an indigenous leader called Sabino Romero was assassinated in Venezuela. And it was really tragic and shocking for me. And it drove me to do research about the fight of the Yucpa community to recover their ancestral territories. 
but what struck me here was that um, the Yupa were in this very complicated situation, right? Their lands were occupied by cattle ranchers, but were also on top of this massive coal mines, the coal deposits that belong to the state, as does all the subsoil in Venezuela. So they were caught between capitalists, cattle ranchers, and the oil state uh, with no way out of this deadlock, right? At that moment, I was reading uh, a lot of Marx and Marxist thought, and I read Fernando Coronil's The Magical State, uh, this book that completely blew my mind and taught me a lot about how Venezuelan politics was deeply tied not only to oil, but to the subsoil and to nature in general. And um, the Yucpas really never had a chance, I think, because the Venezuelan state, by definition and from its inception, is grounded in its ownership of the land and the subsoil. As Coronil says, the Venezuelan state is the ultimate landlord. It owns mm. soil right. So it's very difficult to fight for land in that context. And most importantly, this oil state <clears throat> plays a central role in what Jason Moore calls the world ecology. Right? Sure. Uh, this indivisible bundle of uh, nature, capital, and the state that, that is premised on the infinite appropriation and commodification of humans and nature. Right? So all this made me go back and look at the cultural field of the 1970s with a very different perspective. And it made me ask um, a number of different questions, like what is the role of culture in all this? How does cultural production and aesthetics and ideas contribute to keeping this system in place? And, and what can it do to make things change? Yeah, can I just follow up and ask, just because I was struck by, by as, a, as a sort of fellow uh, literary studies person, I was struck by the fact that it was these questions of literary value, you said, that you were thinking about um, before this, uh, this kind of change of tack. Um, and, and so how did this, this kind of realization um, factor into how you were thinking about aesthetic value? Um, does, that, does that question make sense? Yeah, I mean, um... That was the first project that I had when I when I began my PhD, and it relates to uh, actually to a project that I to a to a poetry journal that I used to run in Venezuela called El Salmon. And what we did, me and a friend, we did a lot of archival work, and we published poets who had been completely forgotten, who kind of slid through the cracks of the canon of the canonization process of what should be understood as national poetry in Venezuela. Mm. So I was trying to combine uh, reflection about cultural institutions and universities, how they reproduce these ideas about what the nation means and what, and, and the, I guess the role that literary criticism has in nation building processes in the 20th sure. century. So trying to combine that kind of reflection about cultural policies and institutions with close reading of the text and trying to find sort of connection between how this process leaves people, leaves poets out, and a connection that we, between that and an interpretation. And you know, what, what kind of interpretation does literary criticism usually do? And when does it fail to recognize literary value in forms, in poetic forms that are basically more difficult to interpret or to, or to incorporate in a more solid uh, uh, idea of the canon? So, but that was very different, a very different project. Um, but then going through the whole uh, reading Coronel and finding out about the Yupas kind of gave me a different perspective. So yeah, it was, it was kind of a weird path, but it brought me here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's funny. I think what you said at the beginning was really fascinating that this seems like it should be a, a straightforward story, but uh when you ask people about how they came to their kind of research obsessions, it seems like it's rarely, rarely a, a straight path. Um, so it's, that's great to yeah. hear about. Um, well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll bring us now, direct us now to the, the theme of our cluster, um, representing oil, as I was saying at the, at the outset. Um, and it seems like that you, you have something particularly interesting to bring to this question um, as somebody who's thinking about, um, and here I'm quoting from, from your book description, the cultural policies that oil money made possible. Um, 
so can you speak a little bit about the, the challenges or possibilities that oil presents um, either as, uh, as the kind of uh, enabling factor behind cultural production or as a, as a subject of, of representation, whichever direction you'd like to take that? Yeah, I, I've actually given a lot of thought to this question that I think is very important and productive. And of course, there are many scholars in the energy humanities who have written a great deal about it. So how I see it, <clears throat> the thing is that oil has a very complicated ontology right, that allows it to be many different things at the same time. It is a real material and natural substance that makes uh, all sorts of products and creates all kinds of damages in the environment, like oil spills and carbon emissions, you name it. But it is also a commodity <clears throat> that circulates through a massive global financial system that is highly dematerialized. And it is also a social relation, as Matthew Huber says, <clears throat> because its material capacities are only mobilized in certain historical and economic circumstances, and so on and so on. So I think that this quality, this multiple ontology, conditions how culture and the scholarship about oil approaches the subject right and if you think about it the scholarship seems to be divided along similar lines some say that seeing oil as a commodity only in its circulation through the financial and energy system you know obscures the fact that oil is in fact nature and that it has a relation to labor and that it um, has material effects in sites of extraction or in oil spills so direct environmental damage. And I think this is a fair point because a big part of what sustains um, oil's regime is the invisibilization of those effects. But at the same time, <clears throat> representing oil only in this form as a material substance doesn't really say much about the fact that under capitalism, we mostly experience oil as a commodity, as an energy system, as a financial and economic system of planetary and global dimensions. So I think that all this relates to an ongoing debate about the visibility of oil in cultural production. You know, how, where do we see oil? How do we see it? How should we look for it? How do we represent it? In Venezuela, a lot has been written about whether there is a petroleum novel, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here in the, in the global north, uh, there are there's the energy humanities, as I said before, and the petrocultures, the idea of petrocultures that tries to name the, the cultural practices that sustain oil's energy regime, mostly by keeping petroleum out of sight, invisible. Uh, but then at the same time, others, other scholars have said that it is pointless to look for the thematization of oil in culture because oil will always be more than just a theme, it will always exceed and kind of overflow any representational form. So there is this conflict that I think relates to this multiple ontology of oil, depends on how you approach it. Uh, in my research, I try to think of oil both as a substance that is extracted, burned, and represented in literature as a theme, and also as an almost, as this practically immaterial commodity that's always in circulation and that can have effects on, on human societies in more indirect ways. Right? For example, I don't know, imperialism, neocolonialism, underdevelopment, all that. So you have to think of oil in those, in those two forms where it also sometimes appears not even as a literal substance and not even as energy but more as a, as a foundation of the economy as a whole, as a conditioning factor of, of national subjectivity in the case of Venezuela. Mm. Because if you think about it, it, it's only after oil is converted into capital, into money, that it really acquires this devastating environmental effects. What I mean is that oil can leave the ground and flow through pipelines and spill in the oceans only after it has become part of this huge economic and cultural system that that makes it into a resource right uh, so in my research I, I oil is, is not only a theme or a substance but is i see it as an organizing force in the general relations between nature and society and and i see the problem of aesthetic representation 
of oil as part of this broader reflection uh, to theorize the place of culture in the ecology of capitalism. That's why I find that cultural policies and oil sponsorship of the arts are so important. And, and so are more indirect ways that, um, that the impacts of oil development are represented, for example, I don't know, urban photography or art mm. that doesn't necessarily represent oil directly, but is somehow impacted and shaped by it, even in at the level of form, right? And we can talk more about that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I would love to talk more about that. In fact, I, let me just ask maybe a, a kind of crude question uh, that perhaps has, doesn't have an answer, but I'm wondering, is, is is there anything specific uh, or particular to oil sponsored art? Well, I don't know if there's anything uh, particular. I think you, in the case of Venezuela, <clears throat> you have to look at it. Uh, it, it. It would depend a lot on the period that you're that you're studying. Sure. In that the nineteen sense. in the nineteen seventies, there was of course this huge boom. And as I see it, you know, most of the cultural uh, institutions that are still existing today were created after 1958 uh, in the a lot of them were created in the late 60s and then in the, by the mid 70s and and that really shapes I mean when I was growing up in Venezuela all the all the publishing houses that I bought books from and and everything that I used to uh, for school it was they were all founded in the 1970s mm. and and at some point, I even toyed with the idea of this when I was thinking about the canon of Venezuelan poetry, that it was actually uh, formed, I mean, the, the way we understand it now, what the main poets are, uh, it was created in the 70s, I think, you know, it was solidified in the 70s, thanks to this huge investment by the state in the cultural sector. Uh, and, but if you think about other types of uh, other areas of the of cultural production of the cultural field if you look at the visual art it is very evident that uh, from the 1950s late 50s onward um, abstract art is very much in the front of everything uh, it, it becomes the the visual language of the state practically hmm. and um, that relates to a lot of different uh, to a broad history to a very large history of of the relations between abstraction and, and extraction in Venezuela. But in the 70s, you see how the murals of, for example, Carlos Cruz Diez, abstract kinetic murals, were pretty much uh, all over the city. And you can still see them today. Some of them are in very bad shape. A lot of them have been restored with oil money, again, <laughs> recently. So uh, that's something that I think is very particular to that period, abstract kinetic art and, mm. and publishing houses and museums and all kinds of cultural centers created with oil money. Yeah, hmm. yeah and, and so is that, uh, that sort of uh, profusion of, of abstract kinetic art, is that an example of, of what you were referring to as the sort of links between oil as a, as a kind of productive cultural force and, and form? Yeah, definitely. The, the whole aesthetic ideology behind abstract kinetic art had to do with um, the, the way that the artist was capable of handling energy and modifying and transforming the energy of color and of light into events of aesthetic, aesthetic perception. And, and that also related to the way that artists created environments made of color and where color seemed to dematerialize. And you know, there was, there was this entire um, set of discourses around kinetic art that was very similar to what the state was saying about mm. uh, how it would uh, handle the nation's natural wealth and transform it into the visible signs of modernity, you know, and how Venezuela would be transformed from this um, almost rural country, agricultural country before the 1950s into a modern na nation that was completely integrated into the international arena, right, and had like a new sense of respect. So there was a lot of uh, talk about transforming the raw 
matter of nature and the raw matter of society into something more refined that could be a sort of event of perception and of um yeah like a more sophisticated uh, nation and uh and everything revolved around how to capture the energies of nature and of society and channel them into a project into a national project that's really fascinating that kind of shared shared rhetoric of of refinement between uh, between the arts the arts and the extractive state yeah. um well, maybe this is a good opportunity to ask you, um, I wanted to, to ask you to say something about the title of your book project, because I, I think it's really, it's a really evocative phrase, we are like oil. Um, and it jumped out at me, particularly in the context of our, uh, our podcast series here, because uh, we've been talking about our kind of big theme, the lived experience of energy. Um, so I wanted to ask you, it, under what circumstances is it that people experience themselves as like oil? Yeah, the, the title, We Are Like Oil, is a, is a reference to something that Venezuelan artist and playwright Cesar Rengifo said in an interview in 1973. Uh, he was interviewed about this large public work that he was creating for the Ministry of Defense. So it was a mural that was commissioned by the state. And he was arguing that Venezuelan culture should be entirely sponsored by the state with oil money. Mm -hmm. And that corporations shouldn't have a part in it. Uh, because this was the only way that artists could be truly free, as long as the private sector wasn't involved. And then he says that the government should make use of the human materials and spiritual resources that artists represented. And he says, we are like oil, a reserve, but in Venezuela we have yet to be set in motion. And Venezuela todavía no se nos ha puesto en marcha. So as I explained in the first chapter of my book project, I think that he's using this image as a rhetorical device to appeal to the developmentalist and extractive oil state to try to get more support and to claim more spaces, uh, more ways of participating in the nation's natural wealth. And I think this should be explained a bit further uh, to get the full picture in Venezuela, as Fernando Coronil says in the magical state, democracy is understood as the right to get your part of the nation's natural wealth of the nation's oil mm. money and natural wealth. He says that towards the middle of the 20th century or so after the return of democracy to the country, that is after the fall of the dictatorship of Marcos Perez Jimenez, participation in politics and the country's subsoil became synonymous with participation in democracy. Uh, and basically around that time, the political elite uh, agreed that the oil industry should be nationalized at some point in the future, which eventually happened in 1976. And the whole relationship between the state and the people and the soft oil and foreign corporations completely changed. So Renjifo, when he says this, and many other intellectuals after him, they, they frequently use uh, these metaphors of culture as a resource and artists as raw matter that should be exported and then should be seen as something valuable outside of the country in the international space as well. Uh, so he's saying, make us work, you know, pay us, make us work in the same way that you put our oil to work for the nation. And I found in my research that this same kind of rationality, this very suggestive metaphors about oil and buried spiritual resources and all that were the actually the foundation of the cultural policies and cultural institutions that were created after 1958 in Venezuela and throughout the 70s and 80s. Um, but an interesting thing about the Rengifo quote is that it, I think it proves or it shows that, that this was not simply a top-down process for the state uh, institutionalized culture, uh, but it, it was more like a two-way street. Um, the state integrated artists and intellectuals into the official apparatus and in that way actually kind of, you know, kept them <laughs> in check in a way. But the artists and the intellectuals also used their own power and their own uh, cultural capital and symbolic capital to negotiate spaces mm -hmm. of, you know, autonomy and more participation in national public life. So yeah, this metaphor of being like oil was at the center of all that process. 
yeah, that's really interesting because uh, I, you know, I think um, you know one could if one if one reads it lazily, one could read it as as people sort of experiencing themselves as this inert resource to be exploited. But you explained how, of course, oil is a is a substance that has a a particular kind of power, uh, and so maybe claiming to be like oil um, is a way of of actually claiming some agency um, within that structure. At least that's what I'm taking you to be to be arguing here. 